And I think I do have Jesse on the line. Jesse, are you on the line? Yes, I am, Neil. I am so excited to welcome the program. New York Times bestselling author, former governor of the great state of Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, author of Shit Politicians Say, the Funniest, Dumbest, Most Outrageous Things Ever Uttered by Our Leaders. Jesse, thanks for calling, man, and how are you? I'm doing pretty good, having a good time doing the book tour. It was a fun book to do and research because it was pretty astounding, some of the things that have come out of the mouths of our leaders uh, down through the years. We even went back to the founding fathers and discovered they weren't sitting around the campfire singing Kumbaya, that they really was some hostility. Oh, uh, uh, Jesse, and I, don't, I hope you don't mind me. Here's the problem as I see it. It's one thing to go out in space like Star Trek. You know, we've all seen Star <laughs> Trek where you're going from world to world and where no man has gone before because you might run into the Klingons or you might run into some entity out there in space. But what I see the problem being is we're going to use space to wage war back on ourselves. Whoever controls space will control the Earth or could likely have that capability. That's scary. Weapons should not be taken in space that can fire back towards Earth. I think that's asinine and insane, and as a world, we shouldn't allow that to happen. Space should be for exploration and for taking man, as they say in Star Trek, where he's never been before. It shouldn't be used to wage war. But the fact is, what is reality? You can damn well bet we will get weapons in space, and who knows what the world will be like then. I want to address it. Really, the craziest stuff we're hearing out of politicians' mouths today. I don't know. You know, is there a way to deploy it on the ground rather than space? I would much rather see it deployed here on Earth than to be put up in space and deployed up there, because it's going to be like cancer. Once you get the first weapon out there, it's going to spread like cancer. Then all of space is going to turn into nothing but a weapon system. It can't be good for mankind for that to happen because we can't trust ourselves that we won't destroy ourselves with it, not some space alien or the Klingons. You could probably write stuff in your book, add another chapter to your book. War profiteers are war profiteers regardless of where the war is. I'm sure Halliburton will get a foothold up there. I mean, they've profited to unbelievable through the, these ridiculous wars we fought in. Dick Cheney's worth so much money now with his Halliburton stocks after leading us into war for his own personal gain. Are you kidding me? The same people, the same organizations that are war profiteers down here on Earth, you can bet they will likewise be war profiteers up in space. War profiteers know no boundaries, I don't think. Exactly. And Twitter can be dangerous, can it? Who knows? I mean, you're going beyond what I can tell you. You know, I don't know how much it'll cost. Look at what the defense bill is here right now. Only we shouldn't call it a defense bill. We should call it what it truly is, a war bill. Like Dennis Kucinich and I have both agreed upon. Should not be the Department of Defense. Should be the Department of War. Because that's what they do is wage war. And unfortunately now, they're going to look at space as possibly the next or new battlefield. I'll tell you, you know, it makes me worry Man's biggest enemy is himself. Exactly. And you think about when we see what politicians say, a lot of times they're being performers. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's unlimitless. Uh, you know, it could be a war, a cyberspace war, a computer-based war. It could be a war of fought on multiple, multiple fronts when you're dealing with space. Why can't we, you know, go up there with a, with a, a flag with a peace symbol on it and make everybody salute that? You know, that wouldn't be as controversial as Kaepernick, a flag with a peace symbol on it. In, in war, there's an old cliché, anything goes in war. You know, it's he who's left standing at the end wins. Doesn't matter how you end up standing at the end. There are no rules. The newer times. 
They're trying to get the greatest buzz possible. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You'd have to talk to them about that. I think that the basic concept of putting weapons in space is wrong and bad. I mean, we can't even control our weapons down here on Earth. We're now going to put them up in space. And who's going to be in charge of all that? I mean, we had a president shoot rockets into Syria. There was no declaration of war. The United States has never declared war on Syria. Yet, we fired rockets in there. And they try to tell us it's for peace? I've never met a rocket for peace. They blow up and kill people. Now, if we can do that arbitrarily, if a, a president decides he wants to pump 50 rockets into Syria, what's going to stop that same president from using some type of technology from outer space if he or she gets upset or, over something? I think all weapons in space can only lead to disaster. Jesse, it's just like, it just seems so much, so much scripted stuff and what some of these people say just for their party line. It just seems inevitable that we're always going to go to war. Uh, nothing is ever accomplished really by war, yet we keep doing it over and over. Isn't that the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and over again in hopes of getting a different result? Well, war is insanity because we do it over and over again with the same old result. Nothing. And, and most definitely, again, we need to have more of a choice, especially when how negative both candidates are. And it's just going to be a Hollywood script the rest of the way. Well, it's certainly helpful uh, if it can keep people out of uh, out of aim and out of, uh, d you know, the, the fact of danger. If you can uh, keep people out of danger, that's a good thing. But like everything, we as man will abuse it. When you have a good thing, what's the first thing we do? Abuse it. So when you come up with a good defense mechanism, at some point it'll be used offensively. It'll no longer be used for defense. And like Dennis Kucinich said so wonderfully, I was a third string quarterback in high school, but I still knew well the difference between offense and defense. I don't know what Hollywood will do. They've already been infiltrated. They can't, they can't do a motion picture without clearing it through our government. Otherwise, the government won't allow them access to military things that they need for their film. So it's a system of bribery that's going on. It's a system of extortion of the government against Hollywood. And it also counters our free speech and First Amendment. When they're interfering like that, you don't have free speech and First Amendment rights in that particular situation. So call me paranoid, but I never trust the government. Always remember, government's made up of people, and people can be evil. Jim, you're younger than I am. How can you be so involved in the aerospace industry at your age? Age is a relative thing, Jesse. Um, so I never really actually wanted to be in the space industry. I, the only thing I ever knew I wanted to do for sure with my life was to race cars. So during college, I uh, bumped into a poster in the hallway. NASA had a program where you could help design space systems to go to Mars, and it was just a, just a class, yeah. So that led me into a job with the French Space Agency eventually, and I worked on a Soviet-French Mars mission back in the late 80s and uh, met a lot of famous people like Carl Sagan, and I became a bit of a Soviet expert. And when the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, I was actually there. Uh, I knew my program was done. I came back to the U.S. and was considered a bit of a, a persona non grata because I'd worked with the French and the Soviets. Sure. And then I, then I got recruited by our intelligence agencies to go back into Russia, put money in to stop the brain drain and the, and the materials that were being sold to the Koreans and the, and the uh, Iranians and all these rogue nations. Now, the United States government has gotten out of the aerospace industry and basically turned it over to the private sector. Is that good? Well, you know, the, the private sector has a motivation of, of doing things and making money at it, which is an inherently uh, understandable motivation, I would submit to you. Uh, the government doesn't have those same understandable motivations. Furthermore, it takes your money and my money as taxpayers and misuses it. So in my view, the military-industrial complex, and NASA is kind of part of the same thing, has become an inefficient use of our taxpayer money uh, because it resembles more the Soviet economic system than even the Russians gave up. And uh, they're still holding dearly onto this, this economic model five-year plans. 
the, the commercial space industry is making real actual progress in the world. We're producing living, breathing cloud, imaging clouds of the Earth with commercial satellites. And in fact, even the DOD is using these to monitor what's going on in North Korea. It's uh, come out in the news where they've used Planet Labs imagery. Yeah, and I think that's a, a very uh, powerful thing to have happen because now we have more transparency. And it's not just the government that's controlling what's done in space. Private citizens are involved. Corporations are involved. Now governments can't hide from their citizens. Citizens can't hide from their governments, from each other, governments from governments. Transparency has always been something that's, that's tended to bring a lot more stability to our human societies. I think it's a force for good. How about a little hypothetical? Let's look into the crystal ball. What do you see five to ten years out on the horizon for us? I think you will see the first man on Mars or woman on Mars, whichever it may be, or first couple on Mars, be private citizens and not representatives of a government. What are we talking about here, a decade or less? Technology is there. The money is there. The will to get it done is there, and it's happening. To go to Mars. To go to Mars. Wow. No stopping us. And uh, when, once we reach Mars, and once we colonize Mars, the most famous human being in all of history will be the first one born there. So we have the International Space Treaty. Is that going to be honored, or are there going to be weapons in space? So there, there's, there is a treaty called the Outer Space Treaty, I believe it's 1967, and it defined essentially a couple of things. One, national sovereignty stops at 100 kilometers. Number two, all signatories agree not to put weapons in space. Now, at that point in time, they were thinking nuclear weapons. So then, then you have to ask yourself, is, is warfare itself in space, like destroying other people's satellites, the equivalent of a weapon? Because it's not quite nuclear weapons. In light of the private sector going into space now, what's to stop war from occurring in space? The reality is there are weapons going into space now. The Chinese destroyed one of their own satellites in 2007, January 2007. We did a uh, experiment where we showed we could do the same thing with an SM3 several years later. Those are all weapons and space examples. And so you could take the argument that one side does it, the other side has to do it. It's, it's a big problem that we don't know how to solve. Can space be used as the place to fire back at Earth? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to suggest to you that space is going to be a lot like the American frontier was, that wars will be fought there over, over the property, over the, over the territory, over the resources, over the prestige, over the so wealth. So man itself hasn't grown beyond that, huh? Not in my experience. The Wild West, you mean it's going to be like Bat Masterson and Wyatt Earp and the fastest draw is going to win out in space? That's what it's going to be like? The first settl real settlers of this country weren't representatives of the English court. They were actually uh, merchants that came here. My ancestors were merchants in the early 1600s that came at the same time of the pilgrims. They came here searching wealth and freedom. And uh, those are going to be the people that go out there and establish the first presence there. And the war will follow because humans are, are part of that. All right, Jim, give me a positive. Give me something my viewers can look forward to and have a good outlook on the future. So number one, the most important human achievement of all history, I believe, will be the first human born off of this planet. That represents, in terms of our evolution of our biology, the most masterful accomplishment that we have made. Forget about cell phones, forget about nuclear weapons, forget about all those things. You have a rocket, you have whatever it is you're going to take into space. What type of approval do you need to do this, and how much in advance do you have to go to get that approval? So to get the original approvals, it's like a year. About a year ahead of time. To so get if approval. you're planning now, or planning, you've got to plan a year ahead of yeah, time before the launch happens. And each, each launch you know, takes weeks, sure. typically. Um, since we're talking about launching within my company, 500 uh, launches a year, we're trying to change the process so they, they bulk approve our our individual launches. So yeah, the coolest thing we're working on at Vector is actually something we call Galactic Sky. So we're building the rocket, which is to get more of these, these commercial assets, these, these satellites into space, and do it economically. We're charging a million and a half per launch, which is more the size that, that small companies can afford. But to, to further that whole barrier to access to space, lowering the Galactic Sky constellation, we're going to build and put up, will allow users to make an app, just like you would for a mobile phone, place it in the space so you no longer have to build the satellite 
uh, layer to, to get your data from space. So what we ideally want to do is put the equivalent of a cell phone network as a space layer that is available to anybody with, with a few thousand dollars and uh, bright enough to come up with an idea that might work with the functional equivalent of a cell phone. I think that this is a great liberty producing uh, capability. I think it's something that will produce great economic value. I'm not smart enough to know what all the apps are. I'm smart enough to put an infrastructure together that people can exploit. Thank you, Jim. Space. How did they say it? The final frontier. Star Trek, William Shatner. Now, if we've looked at the proliferation of the Internet, we've seen that it's brought a whole movement of things together. I mean, information is free now. Of course, they're trying to censor it with Google and other things. But we actually have the ability. Anybody can go out. They can put their content out. They can get word out. And anybody can access that. But there's some concerns with... ISPs and the infrastructure of it being used to kind of control information again. China has what's called the Great Firewall of China. We joke about it, which all the traffic in and out of China is filtered. They can't let certain things in. So a decentralized internet, think about it, instead of it being the grid, right, their grid, their telephone poles, their roads, their everything, we can build our own devices that talk to each other, and we can all talk to each other as peers instead of having to go through their grid and paying subscription fees. And then with that, we tend to build the network ourselves, and so everybody having a cell phone would talk directly to each other instead of cell phone towers. And then that can talk to cars that may have mesh devices in them, and then they can talk to satellites that can go across continents. So in a way, it's a more robust infrastructure as well because it can't be tampered with, it can't be changed, it can't be manipulated because it's owned by the people for the people, and it's literally built from the people. So in order to shut it down, shut down free information, you'd have to shut down every single device. You'd have to destroy everything. I agree wholeheartedly. I can't add anything to that. <laughs> Keeping weapons out of space is a good idea because you can't trust man with a weapon. Well, uh, theoretically, that would be wonderful. But theoretically, is that all we would ever use it for? Can we really be trusted that well? I mean, after all, we did drop two atomic bombs. We didn't need two. One would have gotten the job done. The other was done for theatrical importance to try to scare Russia. Now, we sacrifice all those millions, hundreds of thousands of people who died in the second nuclear blast just to make a point with Russia. So how do you trust us not misusing the very technology that they tell you we have to defend ourselves well, defense and offense in our country has become very shaded. You can't tell the defense from the offense. We are no longer with the Department of Defense. It should be called what it was originally, the Department of War. Well, how, how, what surprised me the most is how this is on the horizon so quickly and that it is going to become a reality certainly well within my lifetime, and I'm no spring chicken anymore. Great point, great point. Give us uh, one of the quotes you found from the books so for our listeners out there that want to definitely get this. I can't wait to check it out, like some of the things that you were discovered in, in your research. I don't know, because monopolies in capitalism are not good. Capitalism is based upon what the word says, capitalism, competing. So you need competition. Competition drives prices down, not up. And that's what we're facing in the world today is lack of competition. You see this big conglomerates of major corporations just eating up all the smaller ones, like the big fish in the pond is eating up all the smaller fish. Well, pretty soon the big fish is going to be left alone in the pond. And that's when you got trouble. You got trouble when you get monopolies, because when something becomes a monopoly, that's a same as almost becoming a dictator. You can dictate what happens. So I think that state-owned banks and people-owned banks are a wonderful alternative to Wall Street. Wall Street's in control. Wall Street's been in control a long, long time, and the results have been good at times, but they've also been bad at times for the consumer. Competition's good, and there should likewise be competition in the banking industry. You don't need just the Fed Federal Reserve being a dictator, state banks and local banks are a must. They need to happen and people need to support them. I think it's wonderful. Anything that moves the economy forward 
important, allows businesses to grow. Businesses cannot grow without investment. You need banks to make those investments. When you're being held by the Federal Reserve or the Federal banks, they, they control your life. But if you have another alternative, state-owned, city-owned, I think it's wonderful. But get ready for the fight of your life because the Federal Reserve is not going to give in easily. And they got the money and they'll spend it. There's strength in competition. If you don't have competition, you have a monopoly, you got no game changers. But if there's competition out there, if you give people three or four or five choices, then they make that decision. That is healthier for business, it's healthier for the economy, it's healthy because more are getting into the system and the system is out there affecting more, not just limited. Maybe so. You know, Wall Street's good. I, I don't want to be just a downgrader of Wall Street, but Wall Street's got a lot of crooks. Anytime you're dealing with large amounts of money, you're going to deal with large amounts of people who are trying to win and not play the game and trying to cheat. You're always going to run into cheaters. You know, it happens in the NFL, the New England Patriots. They've been caught twice cheating. You know, it's going to happen. And so it can happen cheating at the banks. So the more bank entities and the separation of all of them is better for all of us as consumers. A public bank is a bank owned by the people, we the people. So today that means, of course, owned by the government, but it could be local governments, state governments, federal governments. Globally, I think at the moment, 22% of banks are publicly owned, owned by governments. Um, but in the 70s, it was half the banks were publicly owned, and then we've had this big wave of privatization. We have one and one only state-owned bank at the moment, the Bank of North Dakota, that takes all the revenues of the state, puts them in the bank, leverages its capital back by its deposits into low-cost loans for the locals. Why has the Bank of North Dakota been so successful? In uh, 2014, the Wall Street Journal came out with an article that said the Bank of North Dakota was more successful than J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. And they said, this article said that it was because of oil. But in fact, there was a huge oil bust right after that. And nevertheless, the Bank of North Dakota reported record profits. Like for 13 years straight, they reported record profits. So it's really their banking model, which is just very highly efficient. Uh, they they don't have to advertise for deposits by law. All of the state's deposits are deposited in the bank. They don't, they don't have high-paid CEOs, no bonuses, fees, commissions, no shareholders taking the profits. They don't have to have, like, branches. They, they're really a banker's bank. So they partner with the local banks. They don't compete with the local bank. So the local bank is like the front office. It goes out and finds the customer and does all the things banks do. And then the Bank of North Dakota comes in and helps with capital and liquidity and basically underwrites the loan. My sense is that the Bank of North Dakota kept a low profile and that's why they got away with it for a hundred years. After the 2008 crisis, there were, first there were four states that stayed in the black and then there were three and then there were two and then there was one and it was North Dakota. So Ellen, why are you so passionate about public banks? You can see all the devastation that's been caused by um, the banking crisis of 2008. In Los Angeles, there's a, a big public banking movement now, and, and it's largely, it's like a lot of young people who are really excited and passionate about the idea that they could actually break away from the big banks that have done so much damage. I mean, we don't trust those banks anymore. They're, they're, they're sucking all the profits out of everything, including our local governments, which therefore don't have the money to fund infrastructure. If you did it on a federal level, I think that the federal government could be funding, just like the Chinese do, fund the project first just by issuing the credit, which is how all banks work. And then the project itself pays it back. So like building a dam creates electricity, which then you can bill for and it pays off the loan. So the whole principle, the whole point is you've got to get the money out there first and then it'll pay back. You can't wait to, until you've got a pot of money. We don't have the pot of money. We've got to create, when we understand that money is created as loans, we can create that money ourselves and we can do many things. I mean, you could do universal basic income, uh, student debt relief. I mean, there are just many things you could do with this system. 
Patrick knows about Wall Street, something near and dear to my heart, Wall Street. Patrick predicted the downfall of Wall Street years before it happened. Patrick, how did you know and tell us now about Wall Street? You just, if you have a nose for it, I just smelled skunk. I knew, and for one thing, I was on occasion asked, had various conversations of the form with older guys who ran hedge funds. They would ask to meet me, I'd go see them, and they'd get to know me a bit, and then sooner or later it would basically come down to, you know, kid, we could make a lot of money together if you're willing to play ball, kind of conversations. And I was kind of shocked, and I started doing the things you would think you were supposed to do, like report this to the SEC, and report this to, when they didn't do anything, report this to, like, the Senate banking people in the House of and what I didn't realize was I was coming up against the whole establishment. And what I was shining a light on, actually, to tell you the end of the story first, about a month ago, a bunch of pension funds in America filed the, what may become the first trillion dollar lawsuit in America. A bunch of pension funds have realized that, there's, that they were ripped off by six Wall Street banks for decades and that there's a crack. Think of it like the pension funds are a tank holding the savings of America, sure. and these six banks figured out how to put a spigot in there like you tap a maple tree and, and drain about 2% per year out. Well, what really happened is, I mean, they're filing that lawsuit now, but in 04, 05, I came across that, and I started talking about it, and I was starting to put the pieces together publicly, and what's happened is, what happened was a whole bunch of the establishment just fell on my head. I was out there saying in 05, look, the SEC seems to be in bed with Wall Street. I'm bringing them this evidence, and rather than investigate, they're investigating me and threatening me. And, and I started saying, like, saying, gee, it looks like the SEC is actually not protecting America. It's in bed with Wall Street. Well, like, the New York Post ran photos of me with UFOs coming out of my head. Like, it's some conspiracy theory to suggest that the SEC... And, well, and I said, like, that this is all going to lead, the system's going to crack. It's going to lead to a settlement crisis. And the truth is, and this has been whitewashed out of history, but on October 23rd, 2008, as everything's melting down, Congress calls Alan Greenspan out of retirement to come talk, and he goes and tells Congress that fundamentally this is a problem of three things, fraud, settlement, and securitization. Fraud was like Bernie Madoff. Securitization was the mortgage-backed stuff you heard about. But securitization has been whitewashed out of history. This was the, I mean, but settlement. The settlement system froze up on that September day in 2005. Settlement is this boring back office process of when people buy and sell stocks, the plumbing that lets the stocks come and go, uh, come and, go and all that work is called settlement. Well, there is this mischief that goes on there, and that mischief is both responsible for how these pension funds got ripped off, and one of the reasons they're now cracking, and on the other hand, it's, a, uh, it's something that is very profitable for the bad guys. What does it mean exactly to have Wall Street have the whole world fall down upon you? There were about six journalists who seemed to be in the pocket of these hedge funds. And, at, and everybody sort of follows their lead. These six journalists just became obsessed with me and writing about me in like 19th century yellow journalism, smarter people who saw it said they knew the, had, the fix had to be in because they hadn't seen this kind of journalism in their lifetime. Just tr everything I said or did, they would spin and trash and everything. The federal government started six investigations, six investigations against me. They would start one, it would go nowhere, it cost a million dollars, they would drop it, then they'd start another. And it went on six times three. What was the end result? What happened to you, Pat, when this happened? Three of the times they basically had to write apology letters for even having brought it, and we insisted on that. Three of the times the SEC forced us to restate our earnings. Now that sounds very bad, and normally if a guy has a restatement, he gets fired, and no CEO's ever had three. I had three restatements, though, that total something like four hundredths of one penny of a percent. I started Overstock.com. That's my platform, okay, Overstock.com. Overstock .com. That's, and I'm very pro-liberty. I've been a long admirer of Jesse, Jesse Ventura. I love what you've well, done with you. your... Uh, but Overstock became, four years ago, the first company uh, to take Bitcoin at the time, the largest company taking Bitcoin was $800,000, a restaurant in Australia. We started taking it, we were a billion and four. 
And so we, we like to think that we save the Bitcoin movement sort of five to ten years in its adoption cycle. But most importantly, we, we've come to understand the, the technology behind Bitcoin. And the technology behind Bitcoin is this remarkable thing called blockchain. I don't want to blow any fuses and get too technical. But the, there's this technology that's been invented called blockchain that you can think of it like a, a, a well, it's going to let us remake the world in a fair way. It's going to let us win a lot of our battles. So, for example, you can apply this technology to Wall Street and create a version of Wall Street that no one can cheat, where all kinds of the mischief that happens on Wall Street actually becomes impossible in a Bitcoin or a blockchain-based version of Wall Street. How is Wall Street going to sit still on this? You mean you're going to tell me that you're going to offer a system with no cheating and Wall Street's going to sit back and say that's acceptable to us? No, this is very threatening. In fact, we can document three quarters of the revenue to the large prime brokers comes from this sort of special crack I described in the system. And we can actually fix it so that money goes back to the pension funds. And, and with this invention that we have, we basically will we'll make a few shekels along the way, but we can fix this crack. But it is threatening, it is disruptive to the crack that is 75% of the revenue of Wall Street. You know, Pat, you're dealing with Wall Street here, Wall Street. So at some point, you got to sit back and say, this could become fatal. When it got really nasty between us 10 years ago, I got very, very public, in, in part because I was threatened. My theory was that if they blow me up, I win. If they blow me up, then everything I had to say was vindicated. There's no question anymore. So I win, and they don't want that either. This seems to bring about accountability. You know, like with money, you can pass money here, pass money there, everywhere. There's no real way to track it, where the money goes. But with this system, you could actually track it right from point A to point B to point C. Think about Bitcoin is there's this mad, think of a ledger, like your grandpa may have run his hardware store up in Minnesota with, this big old ledger, but this is a magic ledger. It's cryptographically protected. It can be read from all over the world, and any entry made in it is, you can't change it, it's immutable. And that ledger keeps track of how much, how much coin, some coin, Jesse coin, Jesse has in his wallet. And when you give some of that coin to someone else, all that's happening is it's being written out of your account here and being added to her account and, and some other part of the ledger. But there's no way anyone can cheat. The more this gets introduced, the more it solves corruption on Wall Street. It's amazing. In fact, I think this technology, which may you may hear more about Bitcoin and blockchain as the years progress, I think that what the Internet did to publishing this may do to about a hundred other industries. Patrick, Bitcoin solves a lot of counterfeiting problems. Can you explain that for us? This technology, it becomes impossible to counterfeit. Uh, everything gets governed by laws of mathematics and the same mathematics that sort of protects the security of transmissions in the military and such, cryptography, protects this so that uh, th there can't, people can't cheat. and. One form of cheating is counterfeiting, making up your own dollars. So all kinds of cheating becomes impossible, including government cheating. Imagine a world where if the government taxes us to build a bridge and we notice that the money we're giving the government ends up in the bank account of the brother-in-law of the Generalissimo, we, it's going to become transparent. So government is starting to realize Bitcoin may give them advantages in being able to surveil it by, by things being becoming digital. Government, once it's digital, there's a record government can follow. But we're going to be able to study government better. And it's going to really allow us to, I think, bring government to account. Thank you. You know, Wall Street, they're supposed to work for us, not against us. They're supposed to be the people that we invest with and create prosperity throughout the land. It doesn't seem to me that they're doing that at all. They're completely out for themselves. They don't care what happens on Main Street. And I think it's time to bring Wall Street down. And Bitcoins may be the answer. Your name? Uh, my name is Roger Veer. Roger Veer. Now, Roger, they tell me that you know about Bitcoins. I hear that I know a, bit, a thing or two about Bitcoins. So. Well, good. Tell me. 
explain to the average person in layman's terms simply what is a Bitcoin. So thanks to Bitcoin, for the first time in the entire history of humankind, now anyone anywhere on the planet can send and receive any amount of money with anyone else, and they don't have to get permission from a bank, they don't have to get permission from a government, they don't have to get permission from anyone at all, and they can send those funds directly from person to person instantly anywhere in the world. And nothing like that has ever existed before in the entire history of humankind. So that's why we're all so excited about Bitcoin. Okay, so what you're telling me here, this is a, this is a world changer. Bitcoin is one of the most important inventions in the entire history of humankind, right up there on par with the importance of the invention of electricity or the Internet itself. That's how big of a deal this is. No kidding. Now, how, what type of resistance and war do you think you're going to enter into with the Federal Reserve? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter because Bitcoin is decentralized and unstoppable. The only way to stop Bitcoin would be to turn off the entire Internet in the entire world and keep it turned off. And the instant the Internet turns back on again, Bitcoin starts right back up where it left off. Well, I'll tell you, it's something new, it's something innovative, it's something i got to learn about, and I'm willing to admit that I don't know a great deal about Bitcoin, but it seems good on the surface to me because it's competition. And anything that's competition is good, and Wall Street could use the competition. I, and so can the Federal Reserve. And I think it provides honesty and integrity that those institutions lack today. And you see it with uh, just the quotes that are coming out, and even with the whole thing that you probably would have had in your book, again, the speech between uh, the, two, the, the, four, the, four, the current First Lady and... and uh, and, uh, and, and, and Trump's wife, and, and even the tweet that Trump ha did, uh, uh, President Obama did eight years ago. It's ridiculous how these things are stolen and taken and everything. Kind of like pro wrestling, right? <laughs> well, even worse. Even worse, yeah. because it's our country and all these mil wrestling's entertainment. Politics yes. should not be. Politics should not be entertainment. And unfortunately, with the news media the way it is today, politics, too, is entertainment. They've turned it into entertainment. And it shouldn't be. You know, the days of Walter Cronkite are over. Now it's all about... See, the downfall of the media was the show 60 Minutes, believe it or not. It's a great show. But 60 Minutes shot to number one, and with the bean counters saw that, they said, you mean we can make money with the news? And that's oh, when yeah. the news became entertainment. There are no rules. The newer times. They're trying to get the greatest buzz possible. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You'd have to talk to them about that. I think that the basic concept of putting weapons in space is wrong and bad. I mean, we can't even control our weapons down here on Earth. We're now going to put them up in space. And who's going to be in charge of all that? I mean, we had a president shoot rockets into Syria. There was no declaration of war. The United States has never declared war on Syria. Yet, we fired rockets in there. And they try to tell us it's for peace? I've never met a rocket for peace. They blow up and kill people. Now, if we can do that arbitrarily, if a, a president decides he wants to pump 50 rockets into Syria, What's going to stop that same president from using some type of technology from outer space if he or she gets upset or over something? I think all weapons in space can only lead to disaster. Jesse, it's just like, it just seems that I think I do have Jesse on the line. Jesse, are you on the line? Yes, I am, Neil. I am so excited to welcome the program. New York Times bestselling author, former governor of the great state of Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, author of Shit Politicians Say, the funniest, dumbest, most outrageous things ever uttered by our leaders. Jesse, thanks for calling, man, and how are you? I'm doing pretty good, having a good time doing the book tour. It was a fun book to do and research because it was pretty astounding, some of the things that have come out of the mouths of our leaders uh, down through the years. We even went back to the founding fathers and discovered they weren't sitting around the campfire singing kumbaya that they really was some hostility oh uh uh jesse and i don't i hope you don't mind me here's the problem as i see it it's one thing to go out in space like star trek 
You know, we've all seen Star <laughs> Trek where you're going from world to world and where no man has gone before because you might run into the Klingons or you might run into some entity out there in space. But what I see the problem been out there, it's going to spread like cancer. Then all of space is going to turn into nothing but a weapon system. It can't be good for mankind for that to happen because we can't trust ourselves that we won't destroy ourselves with it, not some space alien or the Klingons. You could probably write stuff in your book, add another chapter to your book. War profiteers are war profiteers regardless of where the war is. I'm sure Halliburton will get a foothold up there. I mean, they've profited to unbelievable through the, these ridiculous wars we fought in. Dick Cheney's worth so much money now with his Halliburton stocks after leading us into war for his own personal gain. Are you kidding me? The same people, the same organizations that are war profiteers down here on Earth, you can bet they will likewise be war profiteers up in space. War profiteers know no boundaries, I don't think. Exactly. And Twitter can be dangerous, can it? Who knows? I mean, you're going beyond what I can tell you. You know, I don't know how much it'll cost. Look at what the defense bill is here right now. Only we shouldn't call it a defense bill. We should call it what it truly is, a war bill. Like Dennis Kucinich and I have both agreed upon. Should not be the Department of Defense. Should be the Department of War. Because that's what they do is wage war. And unfortunately now, they're going to look at space as possibly the next or new battlefield. I'll tell you, you know, it makes me worry man's biggest enemy is himself exactly and you think about when we see what politicians say a lot of times they're being performer oh yeah i mean it's unlimitless uh, you know it could be a war a cyberspace war a computer-based war it could be a war of fought on multiple multiple fronts when you're dealing with space why can't we you know go up there with a with a a flag with a peace symbol on it and make everybody salute that you know that wouldn't be as controversial as kaepernick a flag with a peace symbol on it in in war there's an old cliche anything goes in war you know it's he who's left standing at the end wins doesn't matter how you end up standing at the end the being is we're going to use space to wage war back on ourselves Whoever controls space will control the earth or could likely have that capability. That's scary. Weapons should not be taken in space that can fire back towards earth. I think that's asinine and insane. And as a world, we shouldn't allow that to happen. Space should be for exploration and for taking man, as they say in Star Trek, where he's never been before. It shouldn't be used to wage war, but the fact is, what is reality? You can damn well bet we will get weapons in space, and who knows what the world will be like then. I want to address it. Really, the craziest stuff we're hearing out of politicians' mouths today. I don't know. You know, is there a way to deploy it on the ground rather than space? I would much rather see it deployed here on Earth than to be put up in space and deployed up there because it's going to be like cancer once you get the first weapon